PTF here, unexpected message, because we had some unexpected events today with Rich Strike and his connections. Uh, now it's learned that they will not be contesting the Preakness next Saturday, waiting for the Belmont Stakes. Is it the right move? I don't know. I feel like, you know, given his running style, even harder deal to get going in the Belmont, a race that rarely produces a pace meltdown. On the other side, distance is clearly his friend. We'll see how it works out. That's the topic for another video. I just wanted to contextualize this conversation with JK, which took place before we got that news, just so it didn't, you know, hit the ground already stale. If you follow my, my logic and know the news business at all. But I still think that a lot of what we say about Rich Strike in this video applies to him going forward in a race like the Belmont. And I think that our comments about the other contenders coming out of the Derby are still plenty relevant. So I hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome to the In The Money Players Podcast. This is our show for the races of Saturday, May 14th. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, back with you in the Brooklyn Bunker once again. Matt Bernier is not here. He is on paternity leave in his stead to open up the show with me. We bring in a man who, for so many years, has been the regular co-host of this program. He is coming to us from, I think, maybe the Bahamas, but far from Planet Texas. He is... John of the Kitchen. What's up, JK? Oh, we get a stuck on mute right out of the box. I love it. Why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? I, I am. I'm in the Bahamas. Um, had to do some wedding planning. So we, we came down right after the Derby um, and, and we're down here getting ready, ready for a little uh, celebration next year. So we're just trying to put some things in place. And yes, we did other things besides wedding planning while we were here. A couple of uh, Miami Vices. That's my, my new... My new drink of choice. What is that? Sitting by water. It's just a pina colada and a strawberry daiquiri mixed together. <laughs> <laughs> a mashup, as it were. Yeah, so we've been hanging out. And um, they got a sports book here that I haven't attacked yet. But I'm thinking about maybe trying to pop in. This is obviously going to air after for the pick six today. And just try to hit the pick six Bahamas style uh, Thursday. A little carryover at Belmont. So we'll see. You know, we got to start doing carryover shows for Belmont. We've got like an immense amount of them to do in our deal with them probably should have done one for today got lost in the preakness madness this will be completely irrelevant to people who are listening to this on on, on friday by the way but anyway but just as a note production meeting in the middle of the show when we see carryovers let's start pouncing on them you don't necessarily have to do the show but let, it can slip through the cracks for me in a busy week so uh holler at me and and and, and that's right ladies not to bury the lead if you if you hadn't heard already JK crossed off the uh, the most eligible bachelor list. <laughs> We're here to talk Derby. And you and I have not spoken about this except in a couple of cynical text messages. Now, I've described my journey from complete frustration slash feeling insulted because of the way we've chosen to spend our, our, our lives as, as gamblers and analysts by this result, I've sort of come around to the idea that anything that promotes racing, that makes racing look interesting, that gets national attention for racing is good. And I've also quoted the professional poker player uh, whom I interviewed many years ago, who said that when she gets rivered by a two outer, you know, when these terrible things happen or unpredictable things happen or random things happen, rather than get upset, she just takes a deep breath and says, that's okay. Cause people play, if I put myself in those positions, if other people get lucky, that money is eventually going to flow back my way. That's the way I am now choosing to look at this year's Kentucky Derby result. I sense just from talking to you for 12 seconds off air on the topic that you, you still might be in that feeling insulted by the result stage. No, I know. So, so to back up a little bit, my, my Derby day was, 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 was wild. Right. So because we had this, so bear with me for a little storytelling because we had this pending trip, we, you know, I'm going to Preakness. We had to go this week to plan. So, we had the dog with us in, in Lexington. We had to get back to Saratoga to drop the dog off. And then 
get down to the city to go to the Bahamas. So we had to leave on Derby Day from Kentucky. We had a flight at 7 a.m. We woke up at 5.16 to find out that our flight was canceled. It was going to get back to Saratoga by noon so that I could catch the couch and watch Derby Day and enjoy the entire day. We got rerouted, had to go to Cincinnati, then had to fly from Cincinnati to uh, from Cincinnati to, to, to Atlanta, Atlanta home, just a nightmare. And so, so once I finally got home, I watched the Derby in the back of an Uber on my phone. <laughs> and so all, I was already annoyed by how it was all going down, you know, just unlu- unlucky situation, but I watched the Derby like that. Um, and being alive to Zandon for, I don't know if I've said it before, but it was like about seventy five, eighty thousand dollars at the end of the day with, with the with the future wager, but then also with some exactas that I forgot that I had bet fifteen dollar exactas I forgot I'd bet in the first pool with Epicenter and Epicenter and Mo Donegal. Oh Jesus! So as they turn for home, I'm feeling like it's gonna go one way or the other. It's gonna go ten. It had to. And we had to. Zandon was going to pass Epicenter, and then when Epicenter dug in, Epicenter was going to come. That and then what the hell's that down at the rail? And so I'm we're in the car watching it, me, Rigatoni, and Jovanina, and we're and we get we get beat right as we kind of pull up to the restaurant to like hang out with the family and watch. We were going to watch the race there. So everyone else is obviously overly disappointed. You and I and the people that are listening most are. are, are tried and true horse players where you can, you can shake it off and turn the page pretty well, but everyone else is so devastated. It kind of sucked me into the trap for a minute and a half. And then I realized to myself, this is what makes the game great. This is why the Derby is special is because random ridiculous horses that will never win again can sometimes win the race. (laughs) And that's honestly why you wake up in the morning knowing you have the best horse or you or, 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 or betting American Pharaoh or justify or betting uh, if you liked authentic or wh- whoever you, you wake up every morning on Derby day. And no matter how good your horse is, you're still nervous because there's that thing in the back of your head that reminded you that random never win again, horses can beat you. And that's what makes it exciting when they run by you for the first time. That's what makes it exciting when they turn for home. And that's why, the race is so special. So although it's annoying, it's part of it and the page is turned and it is what it is. Well, you, you have some strong opinions about this horse. So, so I'll just interject right away. You say rich strike will never win again. He's going to look pretty good in the claiming crown JK. Well, yeah, yeah. No joke. Right. Cause he's running for 30. He could qualify. Um, you know, you know, and I know we'll kind of turn the page in a second, but he, he, he's going to be a takeout reducer for at least a little while. Uh, there's going to be another takeout reducer in the Preakness. Whoever you like in the Preakness to bet to win, you're going to get value on because those two horses are going to be your takeout reducers in the wind pool. You're I'm not referring to the Philly secret oath or you're referring yeah. to simplification? Secret oath. Okay. We'll get, let's stay with Rich Strike for a minute because you know I've been making the anti case. So now I have a chance to play a little bit of devil's advocate and just say, look, I mean, I'm teasing about the claiming crown. Obviously this horse, you know, he's going to try, he'll, he'll go with, it'd be very unlikely for him to turn up there because I think, you know, they, they'll, they'll try to find, they'll try to find obviously graded stake spots. And, you know, I mean, I can't say he has zero chance in the, in, in the preakness. There is some world in which the way that he finished, you know, the figure that he ran that, that he, you know, somehow trips out again. But I mean, yeah, it's a one in 15 chance to me. And obviously he's going to be way lower than that. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm with you, but I mean, we've seen the impossible for it. We don't, we go back to mind that bird. Okay. Mind that bird. I would have told you all the same things. Now I know mind that bird had better form than, uh, than rich strike coming in, but it, it still seemed impossible to me that he'd even hit the board or at least, it, it maybe he could have been third, but you know, in the, in the Rachel Alexandra 2009, I think it was um, Preakness it, that horse was not supposed to run well. And he was just so sharp coming off that big effort that he didn't manage to put in a big run. You don't see that. You clearly don't see that scenario at all, but I, I'm curious as to why, like what, what's the big difference between mind that bird and, and, and rich strike to you. Well, Rachel set it up for him in that race a little bit. I mean, he did yeah. run well, don't get me wrong. 
Um, he, he did run well in, in the previous. So I don't want to take that away from him, but sure. I mean, I can't, I can't, there's no argument to that point. Could he be mine that bird? Yeah, I, I guess he could be mine that bird. Um, I just think that he got, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm basically saying the same thing for mine that bird. He got a extremely, I'm talking about rich strike, got an extremely fast pace to close into and one of the most brilliant rides you'll ever see. So on in any day of the week, I don't care if it's Wednesday at, at Aqueduct or, or, or Monday at Mahoney Valley, if you're looking at a race where a horse got a huge pace set up and the best ride you've ever seen, this is a horse you're not, you're not betting moving forward. And when it's a derby winner, they're going to bet the horse. Um, oh, I just don't think he'll ever win. I mean, look, I mean, maybe he'll win a, another race, just some, but he's never going to win another race that means much. He's just not that good, and he got a perfect scenario on that day. He'll never run that fast in a figure again because he'll never get sucked along in a pace that fast against those good horses with that dream trip. Yeah. Um, he just nothing in his form had ever suggested he wanted to run a number that was that fast. No, for sure. I mean, it was one of the, it was the, as I had said, I'm sure I've used this line on air before. So forgive me if listeners, if you've heard it, but JK, I don't know if I've said it to you. My line on ABR was if that thing should somehow win, it'll be the biggest upset in Kentucky Derby history. Never been so right. And so wrong at the same time. And to your point, and, and you know, I mentioned mine, that bird who never won another race after the Kentucky Derby. I mean, he ran a winning race, I would say. Yeah, yeah he ran well in both, the, the, yeah. the Preakness and the Belmont, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. So Yeah, he did. He had a triple-digit figure in both those races. They were races that could have won it in another year. But I think you make a good point about Rachel burning off all the speed, and and there you go. Let's talk about some of the other runners coming out of the Kentucky yeah, Derby. Just, just, a, just one more good note. Please. Not only did Rachel set fast fractions, she dueled with and set fast fractions over the eventual Breeders' Cup sprint champion in big drama. So it, it was a real pace that he closed into that day. Yes. How good was she, by the way? Nobody ever mentions that aspect of Rachel. The, 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 that's a great point about the form line, the big drama. Let's talk about the second and third place finishers. I assume you are with me, JK, that Epicenter was best in the race and that it wasn't close. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zayden didn't really have an excuse, in my opinion. He got bumped a little bit at the start, but he got a really good ride. You know, I guess maybe you can make the argument. And now, now, stay with me. I don't, I don't want, I don't think Fl Flavian should have done anything different in that race with that horse in, in, the, in the Kentucky Derby. I have no problem with being more aggressive. We've talked about that on the show. I, if I'm going to err, err on the side of aggression. I do think Flav probably moved a tad early into a hot pace. Hindsight be 2020, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if we go back, I wouldn't want him to do something different necessarily. I just think looking at it in hindsight, that's probably what happened. Um, they both ran inefficiently to me. The epicenter ran even more inefficiently, though. Yes, Ep yeah. but epicenter was so epicenter, I thought was best. Epicenter, um, is the type of horse that if he was running in the preakness, I haven't really looked at a lot of problems. He's running in the preakness, I'd single him, you know, type of yeah, deal. He is. he is running, yeah. Also, he'll be a, a, a Based on see who else shows up, he'll be a dead single for me because early voting will probably be in there. He'll sit off early voting. And, and then we also talked about this. You tweeted about it in a different way when you said that the pace next year in the Derby yeah. is going to be opposite. That, but that also happens in the Preakness. Yeah. When it's a meltdown, remember Oxbow, part of a meltdown in the Derby. Yeah. And then walked on the front end in the Preakness. Shackleford. Same. And then, you know, so I, I, that happens. You know, everyone's going to be very nervous about that, and they're going to go slower than they did in the Derby and Epicenters with a set of beautiful trip. Yeah. Um, so You're saying now, this is crazy to me. I mean, not crazy, surprising that Zandon is still under consideration for the Preakness. I, I mean, look, he's a good horse, but I see personally absolutely no reason for him to finish ahead of Epicenter. I mean, I thought he went there to win the race, and, and Epicenter turned him away with the worst trip and my gut just my horse player gut watching Zanzan is he just probably doesn't want to go quite that far um yeah I mean I'm not sure we'll see about uh, we'll see uh, about that I, I I do think that epicenter's best and if I was if I was you know putting my previous ticket together right now obviously pending the draws and all those things I would be singling epicenter and using Zandon as, as, as a lone B one of those types of situations where um you know, I just think I, I just think that that epicenter 
ran the best race. He was arguably the best horse going in. I just hated his draw down on the inside because I felt like it was going to kind of force him into some situations that I think it forced him into. Yeah. I didn't think that was going to happen, but if he's outside, he doesn't have to necessarily, he's probably still close, but he doesn't necessarily have to be as. I think he wins the race. I think he wins the race if he's drawn outside. I really do. And it didn't play out the way I thought it would, where he got really sucked into the early pace. And this is no criticism of Rosario at all. I thought he did. I mean, obviously you want to talk about rides in the Derby. You could talk about Sonny Leon playing Frogger on the winner all day long. It was brilliant. It was like nothing I've ever seen, but lost in all the appreciation for the Sonny Leon ride to me is what a great job Rosario did to, to be able to, to not get caught into that pace still sort of circumstantially, I think had to move too early, but it was, I think it was still brilliant that he got him in the position he was in. And if drawn outside, I just think he would have had more choices, been able to be a little bit more patient, a little bit more in the clear. Is that fair? Yeah. And that, that's what I, that's what I say. And I, I think even Andy and I have kind of, well, have we, yeah, we've kind of disagreed about this at times about being drawn inside or drawn outside. Like, for me, like, yes, good things can happen when you're drawn outside, but there's more options when you're drawn outside. I said, did I say that wrong? When you're drawn inside, you're backwards. You good things can happen inside, drawn inside, but you have options. options. But when you're outside, you need you options, options in the derby. You need options. I, I mean, I, I firmly, I firmly believe that, and it all depends. It depends on the racetrack too. I mean, this is a, this is a course Churchill Downs historically. Now, I'm not talking about on Saturday necessarily, but historically. There's a lot of days at Churchill Downs where you, you for and I can't really explain the physics of this. It must have to do with banking and the way that the, the specifics of the service is. But there's a lot of days where four wide isn't a disadvantage at Churchill Downs. The four wide trip rail trip can basically play the same. It's unusual in, in horse racing, but I mean, we've seen it an awful lot. So for a race like the Derby, yeah, that outside draw, I mean, to me would be, I'd go so far as to call it uh, coveted. Yeah, no, I'd much, I'd much rather be in the clear going a mile and a quarter and then, then getting stopped, you know, cause if you get stopped, you lose all that momentum. Richie says it all the time. Horses don't have gas pedals and brake pedals. You can't just brake and then hit the gas again. There's momentum involved. And so for me, if you get stopped in the Derby, now you have to get back to it. It's just, it's a lot. And I'd rather be in the clear. Let's hear your thoughts on some of the other Derby also rands. I'll just let, I, I'm not going to, th- I can throw horses at it if you want to play it that way, but who leaps to mind that you feel, you know, interested in either, Oh my gosh, what a disappointment or wow, that horse had a trip and I'm interested to bet him the next time in the right spot. Kind of. Thing. Um, I thought, uh, you know, just the, on, I'm glad you asked me this. This will be quick ones that I haven't fully thought about. I'm just to give you my initial re- reactions. I thought Tiber ran a little bit worse than I thought he would run. I thought maybe the figure would at least, carry him to beat half the field. Uh, but maybe that's what happens when you try to win the race and with a horse like that, you just kind of, you know, whatever. Um, I thought, um, <laughs> I love Brad Cox, but I was happy to see, never mind. Um, Barbara Road, I thought ran better than I thought the Oakland form was going to perform. Agreed. Now, but keep in mind, before we start getting excited about that and wanting to bet him in the Preakness or bet him in the in, in, in the Belmont if he shows up in either one of those, he got a setup too, right? So I think he's I think the form was propped up based on him, you know, getting that that setup. Um, I he's Mokata, an interesting minor Derby horse to me. He's just such a hard trier and a likable horse. Barbara Road. I just don't think he has the talent to hang with the best of 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 this. Of yeah, this cross, you know. Exactly. He's a he'll, he'll, he'll win the Oklahoma Derby or something. And I don't, yeah, he's I don't a fighter though. Cool horse. Um, I thought Modonigo ran fine, right? I mean, he got like fifth or sixth, didn't he? Yeah, he ran fifth. And this he's an interesting one. If you are a ground loss believer, you can really conjure a case that 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 he's okay. Um, it's just and it's funny. I, I'd love to hear your 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 opinion as it when when he comes back. I feel like Irad was just unlucky. I mean, if you told me that what happened was going to happen with a big closer making a rail run to win the Derby, I, I'd have said a hundred out of a hundred that it was uh, that it was going to be uh, Mo Donegal being the big closer up the rail. But I feel like circumstances just conspired, and I mean, Irad literally came ten wide. I think yeah. so. If you want to give him any extra credit for that. Uh, it looked he looked a little flat in the lane, but given how much farther he'd run, 
I, I, I'm keeping him on side going forward. Yeah. And then what? Uh, I guess the other one that kind of got a little buzzy and took some money, I was never really fully involved with um, Messier. When he split the field or did he go – he went – no, he up. bombed out, but he made he was uh, he made the front. He won right. the. I guess he was best of speed. Um, yeah, right. if you want to, yeah, because epicenter was too far back for me to call him best of speed. Yeah. So Messier, Messier, if he were to go in the Belmont, has a Palace Malice kind of look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love that. I love those Derby speed and fades are the best. Like like you said, Palace Malice. You know, Oxbow was was got his done in the Preakness, but those Derby speed and fades are, are definitely useful. Yeah, it was that form with mine was surprisingly bad out of Santa Anita Derby, but I think it could be argued that it's circumstantial. Now, Taba to me never looked good. I think that theory that I had put forth about, you know, and you know, I'm not, this isn't red boarding. I, I argued both sides of it. I said, I'm using on figures, but I worry that the too much too soon, the owner picked spot that it all just catches up with him in Louisville. And that's exactly what it looked like. So I think you can excuse that for that. And then Messi, I think you can just excuse because of the pace. So I don't think those horses, either one of them are that bad, but uh, obviously the form line looks like crud after, <laughs> if you just look at the chart, who else do you have any thoughts on uh, coming out of there? Positive or negative simplification was one yeah. who outran his odds and, and will be coming back in, in Baltimore. But I mean, for me, very much of a setup, but you know, cool horse. Yeah, you know, you had a lot of really nice works um, down in Florida and leading up to this. I just didn't think he was good enough from a speed figure standpoint, but they're, they're all good enough if they get the right scenario. That's, and that's that's horse racing, right? It's like, like uh, it, you know, they're all good enough if they get the scenario that's right. And so that simplification got that. Barber Road got that. The winner, Rich Strike, got that. You know what I mean? So it's like you get, you know – so that, that's that's but that's also what's great about the games. What kind of keeps you coming back is trying to find to look at the puzzle and say this horse who doesn't appear to be good enough. The public isn't treating as good enough. The horse is 20 to one. But today he's going to get a situation that works for him. Everyone who's listening has found that one horse that one time. And it's it's a great feeling. There's a phrase and a saying I'll bring up. So, so, and this is more of an English phrase, but it, it translates perfectly to American. And I use it, but I haven't heard too many other people use it. The idea of conditions that are going to see a horse to his best effect, hmm. you know, and, and that, and that's the idea. The pace can allow you to be seen to your best effect, or it can allow you to be seen to your worst effect. And, and that's why, why do slow horses beat fast horses tortoise and the hare style, like we saw in the Kentucky Derby it's because of extreme pace scenarios. You'll see big, long shot, you know, big, long shot wiring. You'll see a big, long shot coming from last. I mean, there are a disproportionate amount of cap horses to bring in a term from the contest world are going to be produced by extreme pace scenarios. But then as we move forward, and I know you and I, look, there are situations where even this derby, I talked about playing it for a meltdown. It's one of the reasons why I thought of Zandon, um, a Zandon Modonagal exacta was so likely uh, you'll play it for a pace scenario, but woof, when it comes to reaching for these horses that, you know, maybe have a glimmer of, uh, you know, a good example, rich strike um, had, and, and this amazes me, JK. I don't even know if you saw this. If you look at that, that time form late pace rating actually had the highest one in the field, which is just shocking to me. Now, uh, listener uh, uh, Paul Cush pointed out that he just thought that was completely ineffective, the horse coming from synthetic races and, and, and allowing that to happen. But, you know, then the other part of this is, okay, so why don't you, you know, put out more of these speculative wild long shots that can maybe win, you know, if X, Y, and Z happen. And, and it brings to mind the great Damon Runyon quote, the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but that's the way to bet. And I think that speaks exactly to the way you and I look at the world, especially in our job as analysts, but also as betters. I don't want to think, oh, if X, Y, Z, then maybe, you know, this 20 to one shot can get involved. You know, it, that's just not, I don't think it's our job, especially as analysts to look at the world that way. Um, look, 
sometimes it comes, it's not like we never pick wild long shots. See, we, we both had uh, plenty of them come up on, on both TV and the podcast over the years, but it's not my starting point. I, 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 and I know you feel similarly in terms of how you approach trying to pick, pick horses in this game. No, I don't have a starting point or my ending point. I'm not, I don't need to, I don't need to, I don't have, I don't have, <laughs> I'm not insecure enough as an analyst and like a, whatever pundit or whatever that I need to like justify myself by giving you a bunch of 12 to one shots that run third. Like, I don't know. I don't care if you don't want to bet a four to five shot I give you, then bet the one you like. That's why we play this game. And I don't even, I, I they would rather race again. I wouldn't bet rich strike. So <laughs> that's why, that's why I don't give a lot of people. There's a lot of people that, there's a lot of Twitter warriors that think that we're supposed to sit up here and give people 20 to one shots all the time because that's a positive EV play, but it's only a positive EV play if you're playing all the time. And the people who are listening to us typically aren't playing all of it. You know, they're, you know, they're making their own opinions, right. Or whatever. Sure. They're listening to us for ideas. I don't, you know, you know, you gotta be fired up, Pete. I, I, I like it. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to, I just, I don't, I, I doesn't even cross my mind. But you pick, the other thing is when it is, you're predicting an extreme pace setup or you have negative opinions on a favor, you absolutely will reach for Oh, no, I'll pick a, I will pick a long shot if I think a long shot can win, yeah. but I'm not going to, to think that Zandon can win, bet Zandon to win, and then give you rich strike because I'm scared you're going to say I'm picking chalk. That's ridiculous. What else? Well, I mean, also, there's plenty of 20 to ones, plenty of, and, and Rich Strike's a great example of this. 80 to one is an underlay on the horse. I mean, what he paid in the exacta, which I didn't even believe when I first heard it, is much more representative of his value, 200 to one. Honestly, I, I think he was probably more like 800 to one. I mean, I'm really serious here. No, this, no. this was really an insane upset. So to, there's not, just because a horse is a long shot doesn't mean that the horse is value. I mean, we, we say no. this all the time. There's much better value to me on a horse that's going to win. 50% of the time that's three to two yeah. than there is on a horse that's 25 to one that should be 15 to one. It's just math. I bet an even, I bet an even money shot. Marshall Graham and I both did maybe about a month ago. That is the best value I've had all year Yeah. in Lone Rock. Yep. I don't know how the hell they let that horse go off at even money. <laughs> he had a horrible trip and barely won, but the, the, the free money. Yeah, people don't understand. They miss the term misvalue. Uh, the term value might be the most misused in all of horse racing. Let's bring it back to the winner. Just got a couple minutes left here before I uh, I will spring you. The 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 one you know. So it felt like a kick in the teeth. The whole thing. And then I got kicked in the teeth all over again when I was doing my post race analysis. And I went back and really looked at his breeding. You you know what I'm talking about here. The keen eyes. Keen eyes. The horse who famously stuffed us into a locker, cost us tens of thousands of dollars in one of the biggest, one of the other biggest upsets in horse racing that I've ever seen. Have you seen the joke going around about the, about the Keen Ice family reunion? No, no, where's it at? It was something to the effect of Keen Ice saying to Rich Strike, you know, son, you know, no, no pressure, but I pulled one of the biggest upsets in horse racing history and Rich Strike turning to dad and saying, Hold my beer. <laughs> That's true. I mean, they're both pretty shocking. Uh, <laughs> they're both pretty shocking. Keen Ice was actually an okay horse, though. He had won some okay races, and oh, and he, sure. was kind of, he was also like a buzz, like a buzzy horse for lots of people on that Triple Crown year. There's people that liked him in the Derby. They liked him, you know. I'm pretty sure he ran back in the Preakness, or if it was the Belmont, they they always liked that horse. So not too shocking. Yeah, he was third Ice, in the Belmont. Dale second Roman. in the Haskell. I mean, he had good form. It was just, I mean, he was only 16 to one. It was more, I think the historical weight of, uh, and you know, what, what what we all knew how good American Pharaoh was that, that contributed to the, the yeah, triple, triple crown winner. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was indeed shocking, but on the map, it wasn't anywhere near the type of upset. I just thought it was funny. And yeah, I mean, the just very ironic to, to see Keen Ice continuing to, to kick the old teeth in at this point. Um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, what did he do? I, here's the funny thing. He only won one more race 
after the after the Travers came out, which I didn't realize. But his body of work was good, and he and he yeah. and he tried every time. You know, he was a cool horse. We'll we'll see if it works out nearly as well for his son. Any closing thoughts, J.K., before we let you out of here and get back to uh, life in the Bahamas? No, they're, they're giving us free breakfast, so I'm about to go down here and attack a waffle real quick. I love it. You do that. Uh, those of you watching on YouTube, we'll, we'll post the other part of the show. If you're listening, it's just going to continue. We'll keep it rocking on the In the Money Media Network.